More Tetris than you can handle. Yep, and now Harry on top. Okay, uh, boom, Tetris for Yanni, and Tetris for Jeff. Jeff with the Tetris, and, and boom, Jeff. Jeff. Boom, yep. another Tetris for Jeff. Tetris. Boom, Tetris for Harry. Wow. Boom, Jeff. Tetris for Jeff. Boom, it's Tetris for Jeff. Scores are neck and neck. This is a very oh, neck yeah. and neck match. It's very <laughs> neck and neck. I, again, neck and neck. <laughs> They're both getting the same place, please. Very fortunate. Three Tetris. Place, very neck and neck. Neck and neck, neck and neck, neck and neck. We're going to be neck and neck. We have our uh, first uh, Our first qualifier first win, for the uh, final. Jeff advances. Corian now advances into the top four. So we've got our top four decided. Three, Three two, one, go! Boom, head just for Jeff. All players neck and neck. And nerves aren't a factor. The newbies. Final. Boom, Tetris for Corian. So now we're neck and neck. Boom, Tetris, Tetris for Jeff. Boom, Tetris for Jeff. Boom, Tetris for Jeff. Harry and Jeff. Harry taking the first round. And we continue with Jonas versus Corian. Neck and neck. Yeah. Neck and neck. Yeah. Oh. It's not. Oh. It's... All right, Jeff Harry. takes one round. So now we're 1 1 with Jeff versus Harry. All right, real neck and neck. Neck and neck. I don't see neck, 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 neck and neck. Neck and neck. Neck and neck. Boom, Tetris for Jeff. Jonas wins the match versus Corian. Harry has been eliminated. And Harry Jeff has... made the top two. Jeff facing Jonas Neubauer in the grand final. Three, Three two, two, one, go. Yep, we're neck and neck. Boom, Tetris for Jeff. Another Tetris for Jeff. Boom, 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 Tetris for Jeff. Neck and neck. Boom, Tetris for Jeff. Boom, Tetris for Jeff. Boom, Tetris for Jeff. Jeff. Boom, Tetris. Boom, Tetris for Jeff. Neck and neck. Jeff takes our first round. Neck and neck. Neck and neck. Boom, Tetris for Jeff. Neck and neck. Boom, Tetris for Jeff. Boom, Tetris for Jeff. Neck and neck. Boom, Tetris for Jeff. Neck and neck. And Jonas takes that round. Takes that round. Now one one. Boom, Tetris for Jeff. Jeff. Neck and neck. Boom. Neck. Tetris for Jeff. Boom. Tetris. Neck and neck. Neck and neck. Tetris for Jeff. Neck and neck. Neck and neck. Tetris for Jeff. Boom. Tetris for Jeff. Neck and neck. Neck and neck. Boom. Tetris for Jeff. Neck and neck. Yeah, that they'll they'll be in the Jeff. Jonas is the lead at the end. Eastman places. Boom. Tetris for Jeff. 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 Boom. 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 Tetris for Jeff. 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 Neck and neck. Neck and neck. Ready for Tetris? Where is the long bar? There it is. It's so not gonna happen, guys. Oh. And your winner, Jonas Neubauer! So that was here uh, at the Portland Retro Gaming Expo last year, so if you'd like to see how it all goes down this year, be sure to check out the finals tomorrow uh, in the Tetris Arena. Yeah. I thought that would be a fun way to start the panel. Uh, we've come a long way uh, as competitive gamers, and uh, now you know we're helping to to have new tournaments uh, that, that encourage people to play at a high level, and uh, um, Portland is a great host to a great tournament, so you know, check it out, guys. Question is, uh, was that inspired by uh, I forget the gentleman's name who was the announcer? In yes, the it was. Uh, Terry Lee Torok yes. was the original announcer. Uh, the um, Nintendo World Championships 1990, and occasionally he would, you know, he'd, when someone would set it up and the long bar would go down, he'd go, boom, Tetris, and. I sort of thought that would be a good tradition to uphold. Uh, it made um, watching Tetris and watching games uh, played competitively much more exciting. And I really liked uh, what, what Terry Torok did, and uh, uh, he was super cool. And I was like, okay, I'm, I'm now the announcer for the Tetris Championship, so uh, what do I say? <laughs> it's just like, it just kind of worked. I'll just uh, go with the boom Tetris, and uh, now it got turned into this meme, and uh, that uh, the original YouTube video that um, that that came from has about 5.5 million views and uh, 8,000 comments, most of which are boom, Tetris for Jeff. <laughs> uh, they even make a t-shirt for it. Uh, if you uh, follow the YouTube link and uh, get one of the boom, Tetris for Jeff t-shirts, uh, it actually supports the tournament. So uh, it, like, some good things come from it, I, I guess. Uh, it's sort of new to me. I actually didn't find out about this until like a couple months ago and I was shocked. I'm like, Oh my god, I'm a meme and I don't even know it. Are you getting a cut? Oh yeah. Well, I mean, the tournament pays me, so it's like, you know, if it supports the tournament and the tournament is doing well and we have more awareness out there, that's, you know, that's good enough. That's, it, it helps everybody that comes to this event and uh, yeah, we're really happy to help with that. Well, he seemed, he seemed pretty genuine back in, in the, the late 80s, early 90s. You could kind of tell when you had those fake game show announcer guys. Yeah, yeah, Terry Torok was, uh, 
you know, he was a showman. He knew how to be a host. Yeah, that was kind of uh, he knew a lot about the games. When he would talk about the games as he was on stage, he would actually educate the players and make them better players uh, if they weren't uh, at that level yet. So uh, bringing that level of pro professionalism way back in 1990, that's amazing. And he was a real trailblazer for the rest of us. He went to every city also. He wasn't just some guy that Yeah, he was the one that, uh, I think that um, in one sense, I heard that somewhere else that, uh, that he was actually pitching to, to do it the way it was done. And after the Nintendo World Championships, he did the Blockbuster one. So he had been involved in some things of that era um, along the way, not just the Nintendo one. Have any of you tried to contact him recently or get him involved in any of this? Or? Yeah, um, I, I believe Adam tried to reach out to him for the original uh, 2010 tournament, but it didn't, uh, I guess things didn't line up. So it ended up being me and Pat the Nest Punk for, for our first year. You've, the, the, the student has surpassed the teacher, I must say, in this, in this case. But. Uh, I, well, well I'll, I'm actually going to show uh, the video of Terry Torok here. Okay. Uh, this, is, this is relevant because it shows uh, Thor and Robin and myself. I guess I should introduce everybody. Oh, These okay. three gentlemen uh, were all finalists in the, at the time, or maybe even today, the largest video game tournament in history. Um, how many hundreds of thousands of kids entered this thing? Do you guys? We don't know, but it was millions. Yeah, I heard two million. Two million. Okay. I mean, it was. They were in convention centers about this size in 30 different cities, and you know, you paid your extra two bucks and you got to play. And you know, hundreds and hundreds and thousands and millions participated. The 30 30 winners from three age groups ended up in Los Angeles for the finals, and all the three of these guys made it to the finals, or this guy didn't. Um, <laughs> But I, I cried on Disney XD, is that a consolation? Not really. <laughs> um, and you know, you would think that game tournaments were gonna take off from that point, and they kind of sputtered along the 90s, and we're gonna talk about some other tournaments later on after the big one here. And you know, now eSports is a thing, but I'm not, not sure if it's the direction we thought it was gonna go, but let's go into NWC here, the, the original. And yeah, I'll just show this quick clip. Um, it, it's of the finals, but what's cool about it is it has uh, gameplay from Robin, myself, and Thor, all in the same video, all within like the last few seconds of uh, of this uh, matchup. So uh, let's check it out. Potential, she's looking at level two. Next to him, Alan Hong, already up to level three. Chris Tang at level two as well. He's looking for his Tetris along bar, big square, and an L shape. No help. Another L. No That's Terry Thor on the mic. Long bar. It's Tetris, Chris Tang. Robin Mahala now set up for a Tetris. He's looking at a T shape. Just like anything else, the history of these events will be lost unless the people who participated in it keep it and try to preserve it. And 
pass it along and record it at least. So you know, thanks for bringing this panel together um, today. And uh, also just uh, having new tournaments that uh, encourage people to, to play the games at a high level. Um, um, it's nice to be involved in that in that now. And uh, even when, though I was competing back then, I didn't think about it. It's like you know someone's got to you know carry the torch for the future. And the fact that we've been playing this sort of like this old version of Tetris for over 20 years uh, it's pretty amazing. And there's even you know new younger players that are that are playing it that weren't even alive when that version uh, was uh, was made. So uh, it's cool just. Uh, uh, having having that history and uh, bringing it forward. I'd have to say the, um, the uh, let's see, the, the cartridge kind of kept the memory alive in the in the face of regular. Every time, every two, couple years, one of those cartridges would show up on eBay and it would go for twenty thousand whatever dollars, and it would make the news, and then it would keep the idea of the NWC alive. And now we've got it reborn with the fifteen and the seventeen versions. Um, did, uh, let's see. Collectability wise, uh, I don't know how to phrase this question, but it's about the cartridge in general. Like, what did you guys do with all the memorabilia that you got from the show? I mean, did, was that, did you keep a hold of it, like the hat and stuff, or did they kind of just go away after time and you got rid of it? I mean, there was a picture of one of those cards that had like a piece of tape on it that said Mario. It was found at a garage sale. So, you know, I wonder how many of these kids were realizing what they were holding when they got this at the time. Uh, I sold everything for uh, quite a bit of money uh, to a collector in Australia that uh, said he idolized us and um, he could never make it to America when, when the contest was happening. He's about my age, I'm 40. And uh, my daughter was born and needed the money and uh, sold it all and wish I had it back. I've actually offered more than double the money for my trophy back and he said no. <laughs> so wow, but it's in good hands. It's not some sleazy reseller. Yeah, it's guy. actually in a, a little shrine in his video game store in Bustleton, Australia. If anybody wants to visit the Robin Mihara shrine, <laughs> the pilgrimage. Yeah, you, you gonna make the trip then? Well, the cost of the plane ticket is about <laughs> the same as what I got, so it sort of seems it's not worth it. But I'll, I'll make it eventually. So uh, there, there's my, uh, the stuff that I kept. Uh, I kept most of it. I sold a few items from it. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of swag here. There's my trophy. Uh, we call that thing in the middle the tombstone because it's shaped like this big black tombstone. And I said that if I ever kick the bucket, I want my actual tombstone to be a replica of, of that <laughs> there. Um, you saw in the video, uh, there, we had these name tags, and it's like this long nameplate, so that's what that thing is over there. Uh, various paperwork, there are a lot of forms, a lot of... Uh, well, quarterfinals, semifinals stuff. Uh, they give you these fabric badges that you'd wear around so you'd have access to the competition area on the last day. Um, program guides, all sorts of cool stuff. Okay, so up in the middle there, you see the cartridge. Uh, I almost sold my cartridge. I actually put it up on eBay, and that's actually how I uh, met Green Bat Robin again. This was like in 2009. And uh, I put it up on eBay, and then I got a message from him, and it was like, hey, Chris, it's been a while. And I was also like, whoa, I just... Making a reconnected, movie. yeah. <laughs> reconnected with a friend by putting my NWC up on eBay, and he told me that he regretted selling his, and it made me think about it, and I pulled my auction, and I didn't sell it. So I still got mine, uh, thankfully. Um, I've been having a rough year, so I considered selling it, but luckily I didn't, didn't come to that. Uh, there's also some like rear controllers and stuff there. If you're interested in owning any of this stuff, I actually have an um, item entered into the live auction tonight at 8 p.m., uh, shameless plug, so if you want a shot at uh, winning some of this stuff, uh, you can actually uh, walk away from uh, Portland Retro Gaming Expo with some of it, as uh, I decided to take some of these items and uh, auction them off, so um, that's kind of where my stuff is at now. How are the nerves in the finals? Um, in my experience in 15, um, I, I won my regional in 15 in Chicago and made it to the finals in 15, um, but I was way more nervous for that because we got limited tries and uh, I wasn't sure if I was going to make it because the, the games were more of an RNG nature. Um, but with, with, th with this type of thing, you guys had to play so many rounds to get to the finals. And uh, what was the competition like in the finals? Was, did, did you find it more intimidating or less? Or like, I made it, I'm in this club of good players, or were you, were you salty when you lost, other than this guy? So. <laughs> uh, for myself, I mean, I, I just kind of did the best I could. The NWC was not actually my first tournament. 
The first tournament I entered was the Hawaii State Nintendo Championships that the TV station Nintendo and a department store held. This was in 1988, 1989, um, and I had never been, I hadn't been to like California or the rest of the country to compete yet. It was, it was just, a, it was a statewide thing, it was kind of a big deal. I got into it and the contest was like um, Super Mario 1, and it was whoever got the farthest with the most points. Um, turns out I was actually doing what they call a speed run of the game now, except I was speed running and score running at the same time, so I beat the game in like seven minutes, and I got like around 256,000 points, which was which I felt was pretty good for, as personal best. In the end, no one else in the whole tournament even beat the game. Wow. So that was my first tournament, and I just like crushed everybody. Uh, and then uh, so I, I was a little confident going into the Nintendo World Championships, but when I got to Oakland, like there were a lot of good well. There was Robin. I had heard about Robin. I didn't actually meet him until the end, but there would always be, I'd hear about this kid that was like amazing and he would like kick everybody's ass and um, I was like, really? And I didn't see him until the end and he kicked my ass. So <laughs> <laughs> he sent me to LA and then, then I, got, I got good, I got better and I won in LA and then uh, I saw him again in, in uh, Universal Studios at the very end. But in terms of nerves, like you just kind of do the best you can. Sometimes, you know, um, I'm really hard on myself when I play. If I make a single like mistake in, in movement or placement or like in a fighting game, like you know, if I get hit, like I, I, I beat myself up. So I'm really hard on myself. I'm really strict. Uh, so it's not a matter of like nerves. It's more like try to play perfectly at all times, and that's just my mindset when I do anything. Like uh, when it comes to playing competitively, I actually play differently competitively than I do casually. So it'll be some tournaments I'll go to like a fighting game tournament, and everybody will think they can tone me. But it's actually just a ruse. And when it comes when it comes game time, when there's money on the line, yeah, yeah, I put on my game face, and uh, it's not pretty. How about your nerve store? I when I when everybody saw that video of you maxing out Tetris, doing it nonchalantly with the guy knocking on the door, total Zen state. You didn't like hold on, hold on. Is that is that how you were when you were a kid too, or is that that with old age? Uh, no, I think I had a lot more stress uh, when I was uh, in the '90s in the BC. I was playing it as like a existential uh, necessity. I had to win. Like, uh, it was like a, I felt it was in a level of survival that I had to to do it. Uh, so I was nervous, but uh, it all kind of felt like it was happening to me rather than me doing anything. If that makes any sense? Like I was an observer. Mm. Um, it was interesting. I was, um, I, I, I guess, I was also not worried about it in some ways. I guess because I, I was worried for so many months, for so long that it kind of became subconscious. When did you win your 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 regional? Was it pretty early in the cycle? Yeah, I think you... uh, one of the first cities. I didn't have a Nintendo, uh, but I had a, a friend in the neighborhood that, that did, and. Uh, I got a ride in the station wagon with his mom to Dallas Fair Park, the, the first city. I guess I was lucky in that case. And I just missed the top seven. And uh, my dad said that if I uh, did well with the homework thing, whatever kind of chores, things he wanted me to do, that he would take me down to Houston a few weeks. I think it was like three weeks later, two weeks later, something like that. And I went to Houston. Do you remember what the top seven cutoff was at that year? I mean, that was the first competition, and I remember Robin saying that uh, back then people were spamming Mario instead of going to Tetris for points at that point. Yeah, I think they were even discussing banning the uh, turtle pop thing or whatever because uh, that was what a lot of people were doing. But the multiplier on Tetris was so huge that mm -hmm. it became pretty clear pretty quick. By the time I got to Houston, Jason Orlando had a, a really good score, I think. And uh, were people breaking a million yet that early? People were right around a million week one. Um, like, you know, the 100, 900,000. Um, the under 11, or, or yeah, under 12, uh, 11 and under, and the 18 and up age groups were not doing very well, I think. <laughs> uh, scores more like in the three or 400,000 were uh, pretty, pretty good for the first uh, bit there, which is interesting. But yeah, the, the night before the actual final finals, I, I played head-to-head uh, -head Herzog's Y with uh, Jeff Falco. We had like a grudge match on a completely different game system. The only type of grudge match you can have with Herzog's Y. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Mathis was a, a tremendous character. He had um, Jeff Knows Tetris hat made, and uh, 
he was just a, a real original guy. I think he intimidated some people. He was incredibly cocky. He was like from Chicago, like South Chicago. Of course. And uh, man, he was he was a blast. It was. Um, I thought that he was my um, obstacle because he was capable of putting up like a high three millions. So I was uh, most concerned with dealing with him, and he didn't come out. Rich Chamberlain came out of nowhere and, and did really well. So let's talk about how the game evolved and how people were kind of made it sort of a Grateful Dead sort of hippie tour of uh, hitting all the different cities. I mean, you, you went to different cities. Robin, I, the story about you taking the bus from here down to uh, Oakland, mm -hmm. which uh, I paid homage to this year by taking a bus to New York City to watch the finals this year, and it was not pleasant, but uh, no. it was good I could do that. And, how many hours? Uh, 12 overnight, both ways. Yeah. <laughs> I, I went in, watched the tournament, left that night, and got home Sunday. Was uh, I slept for about a day straight after that. But uh, I, I felt that one of us in us group needed to kind of represent the old guys at the new tournament, try to keep the fraternity going, I guess, among the finalists, especially if they're bringing kids in again, which I applauded Nintendo for doing that this time around. Mm -hmm. Um, but like, how, how did the scoring evolve? I mean, we're talking one million in Texas, and then you're near the end, I take it, with the with the Portland and the Oregon, or is that with the, the um, Portland and the California? Portland, uh, I don't know if I had heard of Thor, but there was a kid named Kenny uh, that inspired me to get good. Um, and he was a two million two player, which is more than double of when it began. Uh, and he was playing so fast to me that it kind of felt like you were watching somebody that um, had memorized the pieces. But uh, it turned, it was just, you know, Tetris was so new then that like, I didn't know to look at the next piece, that sort of thing. Like, wow. It was kind was, of funny. Like, like in the movie when they, uh, what, she didn't know to uh, Dana. flip, Dana didn't yeah, know to, flip, to flip, flip, use the B button to flip backwards, right. yeah. Mm. Um, and so, and then there was a big hiatus. There was like a month where they took a break, and that's when I did most of my practicing. And then Oakland was actually closer to the middle. You know, Chris? Oakland around the middle of the tour? Yeah, in the list, um, I think it goes um, from, the, from the south, um, from Texas, and then it extends to the east, and then it, the, it goes into the middle, and it goes to the west, and then it ended in Florida. I know that my high score of almost two million was like, like about tied with the highest ever winning score, and I was pretty proud of that. And then I, but I took my winnings and I followed the tour to its last stop just to practice in Tampa Bay, and that's where I found out there were players that were so much better than me that I was not going to win. That was four, uh, Thor broke four million. Keep in mind, high score was nine hundred thousand when this when this tournament started. He broke four million in the final city, and uh, my high was two million nine. So. Uh, uh, watching him play and vibrate the controller was sort of devastating to a lot of us. And uh, there were, I think there were only three players who could even break three million in, in our age category. Falco. Yeah, Falco, the, this guy that we're talking about, Jeff Falco, who was also in your... Uh, yeah, he was also at the Sega tournament. tournament. And he was in a tournament that I won uh, called the Disney Capcom Play Tour. He was actually as good as Thor um, at Tetris, but uh, he just didn't quite put it together at the end. And that's, that's where nerves comes in. I think I, I'll take credit by my defeat of him uh, in Herzog's Y the night before. <laughs> crushed his spirit. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Oakland was about middle of the pack. And I just, um, besides Chris Tang, um, I sort of got lucky because he was really the only other strong Tetris player. The guy that I beat heads up. Um, I was pretty sure that was going to be, uh, unfortunately. We didn't get to meet you in the finals, but we met in L.A. later. That's okay. Like, things turned out well for me in L.A., and I ended up in the game industry because of it, so um, thanks, Robin, for kicking my butt. <laughs> You're welcome. What was your practice regimen then? Because you didn't have access to the cartridge, so did you just set the clock at five minutes and point press and Tetris, or what was, what was the... Three minutes with uh, my mom... Jan behind me with the clipboard to color co uh, code all the scores, and I remember her telling me I couldn't go out and play basketball for that. Uh, <laughs> that year. Um, and I would the one of the differences in Tetris for the NWC was that it would advance every five lines right. out of ten. 
So that levels up a lot faster. I would play half my game starting at level zero to work on speed of shoving it down, but then half my game starting at level five or six so that it would end at the same place, so that I'd be at like a, around level 11 where um, the UC ends after three minutes, if that makes sense. Strategy-wise with, with Tetris at, at the five, le with five lines per level, uh, would you delay a Tetris to advance a level and get the extra points? since there's a time consideration, or is that not strategy not come up? It turns out that's not true. No? Because if you do it, um, this is minutia, but... This is about if you were to, If you were to, say you were like to burn a line so that you would advance in level to get a little bon bonus in score, if you were to do that four times, you might as well have just got a Tetris. Right. It was Nick Whitelessbach that pointed that out to me, that, because I think some players thought about that, and they thought that you could boost the score, but it was like, well, if you're going to burn four lines, you might as well have got a Tetris to get you there. Anyway. Yeah, the other thing is time. Every time you clear a line, the screen pauses and the screen and the line goes blah, 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 blah. And every time that happens, you actually lose half a second, maybe more, you got to wait for the next piece to spawn. So if you're maximizing your points and always going for Tetrises, it's probably better than if you had gotten a single to get a few extra thousand because I could have gone towards another Tetris anyway. Yeah, one thing that I wish that I had thought of at the time, it seems painfully obvious now looking back, but the time to drop a piece from the top to the bottom or even to the lower third of the screen is significantly higher than if you stack up to around a half to two thirds, two thirds of the screen and just forego Tetris's just to get the blocks higher because then you, you're going blop, blop, blop instead of blop, <laughs> blop. Uh, so I could have gotten a lot better scores if I thought about that. Another thing that's uh, kind of infamous is that uh, Depending on, I think, the time in Mario or Red Racer, the score in Mario, uh, you get a, a set piece order in Tetris, which is unlike the standard NES version. Uh, that's another difference. And I never realized this uh, until the, the end of the finals. Uh, there, we played three games that, that day. I got the exact same pieces all three times. And played them terribly all three times, <laughs> totally differently. Um, if I uh, had realized that, looked at the tapes, and, and planned for that, I could have like graphed it all out and made some awesome plan, but I totally didn't. I didn't do all that well in the finals. So if you didn't just kick our ass, you would have completely just <laughs> a bomb destroyed the entire building, <laughs> left in a smoldering pile of red. Yeah, I think. Graphing the, the piece order and doing the high stack uh, time compression technique, I think five, five and a half million easily as possible. It's how the uh, world record is achieved. One of the finals is here. I think it's seven million at this point. Oh, wow. Just, just memorize it. And the same thing with the sequel, the, the 1991 Campus Challenge. Uh, the money game is Dr. Mario, and it's the exact same virus arrangement, exact same piece placement every time. So that's how you can, if you sit down and waste the time to memorize that, but it's not like you guys had the cartridge to learn that. You had limited plays of this thing. You weren't going to yeah. do that in 12 plays on a course of a weekend. Yeah, because so. it, it felt random enough at the time. Yeah. But that, that last, uh, those last three games where I got all the same pieces, I guess I, I locked in on Mario enough to where I was doing exactly the same. Uh, it was just funny to see those pieces. That, I didn't even, it didn't even dawn on me until like the third game was going. I'm like, wait, what, what is happening here? Like a different cartridge. Uh, one of the other things that I did, uh, we were asking about like strategy and, and how managing time was. At the stations, there were like maybe, like a hundred stations um, behind the big throne chair and, and the big screens for the stage. Yeah. They had Velcro in the back of the uh, controllers where you'd stick them on the thing, pull them off. Some of those controllers weren't all that hot, but uh, my mom made me this little refrigerator magnet kind of timer clock, and so it had a countdown, and we set it for uh, the time, the six minutes and 21 seconds, and I would stick it on my station so that I could see when the time was getting short, and um, you know, if there were only a few seconds left, you just burn whatever lines you got, you didn't wait for any touchers. Yeah, I think I just used a stopwatch, too. And uh, it, it helped on stage, too, because um, the announcers would tell the crowd to count down when it was ending, so that was also very helpful. The thing you want to do in Tetris is, uh, if you have a well set up, and it's not giving you that long piece, you want to dump all your pieces that aren't long bars and get that last Tetris rather than run out of time and not get it.
Yeah, I, I, there's a part of the finals where I do that. <laughs> I was desperate to get it and never got it. So uh, let's, cook with about 15 minutes left, let's talk about what happened afterwards. Uh, there was the sequels, the, the Nintendo Campus Challenge, there was PowerFest 94, um, there was the Blockbuster Championships, uh, there was the Sega Rock the Rock that Chris won, and there was the Capcom that uh, Robin won. Uh, did, um, let's go into the Capcom one first, because you can't find anything on anything on the internet about this tournament. Was it nationwide? Was it done at malls? How was how was that? How that go about? Yeah, it was also 30 cities, um, and it was at malls. I think it was at Clackamas Town Center. Uh, the cool thing about the Capcom contest was that uh, one of the three games, Tailspin, no one had played. It was still like a prototype, prototype stage. And uh, when it had, comes to video. I hadn't played that, and I also hadn't played Rescue Rangers, and I still managed to win second, which I was kind of proud of. And then, uh, just like Kenny Welch, my idol in 1990, I followed the tour and um, uh, came in first in uh, Tacoma, Washington, a week later when it went there. Yeah, that's oh, me in nice. the middle. Yep. Got better shoulders now. I get, yeah, I get. The most fireworks. In Tailspin, getting the most points is crucial, while the game DuckTales challenges kids to collect the most money. Just basically skipping everything and getting the last treasure, which is worth the most points. All 31 kids competed in the qualifying round, trying to light up each of the three video games in three minutes. The ten players with the best scores advanced into the second round, where they had two minutes to play each game. Then, the three players with the top scores got a crack at the national championship. After an exciting three-minute round of DuckTales, the points were added up, and a grand champion was announced. First place winner and grand champion, Robin Mahara. Robin, come on out here. Well done. <laughs> well, it turned out there were a lot of people that were as good as me, and some that were even better, but I guess I... Received <laughs> 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 a Super Nintendo Entertainment System, a Sony Bookcase Stereo System, and a Sony Color Television. From Disneyland, this is Scott's <laughs> one report. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the the basic format. I didn't really. It was thirty cities, and uh, yep. Did it? Did it feel? Re did you feel redempted when you won that? Did you? Because. Yeah, but Thor wasn't there. I really wanted to beat him. I think he was a year old, too old. To, to so it was a kids-only contest. Yeah, you, you yeah. could age out because I couldn't enter it. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Falco was there, though. And he, he was funny because he told everyone there that uh, like the highest anybody had got in the time limit for Rescue Rangers was 160. And he told everyone there he had gotten like 330. And we all believed him because we didn't lie to each other. <laughs> and it just psyched <laughs> us out. And then I had my mom, instead of watching me you know, in this big moment, she went and watched Jeff because she was going to go get his strategy and tell me really quick. Um, and it turned out he was lying at like 140. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> speaking as just somebody who, who mainly did the, the 90 NWC and looked at the Nintendo tournaments afterwards, uh, I thought that uh, the the Capcom and Sega championships were, were pretty darn good. Uh, it was exciting to see the, the Rock to Rock. That, he was the big winner of the 50 grand. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty serious. Yeah. The, uh, the follow-up Nintendo tours, uh, I don't like to be negative, but it was a significant letdown to see this gigantic, like, you know, nine-month massive tour that filled the largest convention centers in, in every city going to you know, Universal Studios and, and all that to turn into like a, kind of like a food truck kind of thing that, <laughs> you know you walk up to and it was just really sad to see that climb like it's not like it was a slight step down it's like a totally different universe so and even today like eight Best Buy locations is just like that's that's not a tour that's I don't even know what that is. That's not even like multiple. Let's not downplay that though, because there were incredibly long lines, and they gave enough. Uh, I don't want. No, no, don't. don't it's not on the competitors at all. We're talking about the the, the organizers. Well, that, yeah. Right. What Nintendo put out to to run their competition could be a lot better. Uh, yeah, in terms I thought of the scale. 
the 15 and 17 finals were pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the quality of the players and like the, what they had to play in the finals like were, were pretty cool. The qualifiers. Well, you don't don't say anything about Tetris at 17. Those poor kids had never oh, played man. sticky Tetris at a high speed. And they, uh, <laughs> yeah, there was I a dude. Real, I felt um, real bad for them. Uh, the, the first player on the left side of the screen did not rotate his pieces and popped out in like five seconds. It was oh pretty brutal. Yeah, they, they were they were not prepared. Kids are used to modern Tetris with slides and infinite rotations and not not that. But I, I was excited when I saw it come up and then I realized who was in it. And I, I felt really bad, I'll just say that. You um, only learned Tetris. <laughs> I was born into Tetris. <laughs> So, uh, and one little other funny thing, uh, uh, Stephen Lucas, the guy who won the 1991 Campus Challenge, he also got a Geo Metro, and he still owns it. Uh, I'm looking for him to send me a picture of it, because i got to see what condition this car is in, because it probably wasn't very good condition in 1991, let alone today. But That's a death wish. Like, yeah. He's going to be hit by a bicycle. <laughs> So, Maybe um, he kept it. He kept it new and sealed or something. I, I don't know. He said he still drives it around town. I don't know. Wow. He's a slab it. He's a very centric guy. He's very cool. But uh, the fact that he still owns it, that just kind of tells you what type of person he is. And, uh, but he's he's an extremely good gamer too. Um, the the rock the rock tournament. How did how did that work? Uh, I'll show a quick clip um, for what was on TV, and uh, you should find it interesting. This was shown internationally on MTV. They came from around the world. New York, Japan, Brazil, San Francisco, and all points in between to go up against Sonic and Knuckles. My strategy for this game is basically go on an instinct. Keep your cool and keep moving. Uh, make sure nothing hits you and uh, just be careful. Contestants now down to two. Two guys with the most rings and the highest scores. The contestants are locked in position. So let's rock the rock, man.
Yeah, they call that the gas chamber. I'm not sure if it's politically correct for them to do that. But it was interesting. All this footage that they showed during MTV's thing here, that's all BS. They just inserted random footage and it kind of offended me. single flannel shirt. That is not genuine. <laughs> uh, I guess it wasn't hip in San Francisco. Maybe, maybe in Portland, but not San Francisco. But uh, yeah, so that was Rock the Rock. The funny thing about that countdown was it was all BS. Actually, uh, you, um, I won like 10 seconds before the countdown was over, so I was cheering for myself like before time was up. Uh, you get to the end of the run, you get every single ring you possibly get, and there were like these two secret boxes at the end that I knew about that the other guy didn't. Uh, and uh, then well, I looked at his screen, there's like no way he was gonna catch up, so I'm like, all right, time to party. <laughs> Play, played out pretty well on TV, so I think I made the right call. Well, we got about five minutes left. Does anybody have any questions for these champs up here? Go ahead. So, the way you guys think about your rivalry seems very, you know, friendly and whatnot, but has there ever been like anyone over the years who has tried to track you guys down and like demanding like you pay them more their like unpleasantness? <laughs> No, I mean, um, any of the c competitors that, uh, that I know that I played with, well, particularly in these console tournaments, um, I, I love these guys. I mean, we all kind of like went through a lot of the same stuff and we all have our stories, you know, where our families took us around or, um, you know, we had, we had uh, followed sort of like this path of the warrior to, you know, get, <laughs> to, to get to the finals of these contests. So I have amazing respect for a lot of these guys and, um, we see them, you know, come to the Tetris Championship sometimes, and uh, when, when I saw Robin and Thor again after all those years, I mean, I, I was just so happy to, to have these people in my life again, and, uh, and they're really freaking cool. I mean, you have to sort of like be a gamer um, at, you know, at the core to, to have followed these tournaments and to do well in them, so uh, I haven't had any crazy people like come up and want, wanting to challenge me. Um, I mean, there would be, I think later on, a few years after, I was really heavily into competitive Street Fighter. And those guys are nuts. Like, <laughs> like they'll, yeah. I mean, people were getting shanked at arcades and stuff like that. So, yeah, it was a war zone out there. But in terms of console comp competitions, this is, you know, a really great thing to have the platform holders like Nintendo, Sega, and Sony uh, run really large tournaments. Is they have to make it a family thing, and therefore you know, the people that go to them, you know, they're they're honest people who you know just love video games and. Uh, that's uh, that's kind of what we got, and that's kind of what we get now here at events like Portland Retro Gaming Expo. Here, come on up. These are uh, two prints of posters from the NWC 15 and 17 with all the competitors that signed them. So, thanks for your question. Thank you. Any, uh... Well, let's hear uh, what Robin and Thor have to say about uh, any competitors that... Uh, in the, in... When I first uh, found Thor, it was on MySpace. <laughs> <laughs> and I wrote, hey, are you ready for a rematch? I don't even know if he, I wasn't sure if he remembered my name, but uh, yeah, he did, and I was joking, but um, and then we actually, he introduced me to a PC version of Tetris, and he kind of uh, showed me very quickly that I wasn't going to beat him 20 years later either. It was uh, Block Holes. Anybody play Block Holes? It was pretty, pretty righteous. Um, I created all these alter egos. Um, with diverse names, and it, it was ranked. You know, you'd, you'd have you know the top ten players or whatever. And I'd love to get into matches, and you could chat, and people would argue over which of these characters was the best. <laughs> <laughs> and they were really serious about it. Like Rose Flash, that's the best. No, it's Arcane. Um, he had uh, his his icon was. Uh, 
Ivan Drago. And uh, he's like, I must crush you. Rocky <laughs> Four. Of course, young people here. I'll add, uh, with, I was in the 15 finals and there was only eight of us that qualified and because I knew in their story that they had gotten apart from each other over the past 30 years, I made it a point to keep contact information with everybody within our little group and uh, I just went to one of the guy's weddings a couple months ago in Iowa. I'm out here with two of the finalists this weekend and um, you know I'm putting together things for the eight of us and also for the 17 guys just to make sure that, because Nintendo's not going to give us a call later on. We're, we've done our purpose and they were nice and all, but it's up to, it's up to us to maintain these relationships and, and that's kind of, you know, that's why I'm glad I'm here to be the link between the old guys and the new guys. Yeah, it was tough back in 1990, like there was no internet, mm -hmm. so you'd have to give each other your phone number or address and it's really funny because there are these um, program cards that they have for Nintendo World Championships, they're worth at least 100 bucks now. And uh, I found one of them in storage and scrawled on the back of this thing that I completely defaced it uh, was uh, Robin Mahara's like physical address. <laughs> and I'm like, that's so cool. <laughs> Still lives. So that's worth more than $100 now. Uh, I got time for about one more question. Anybody got a good one here? Um, lady up here. Uh, what do you guys think the future of uh, gaming, tournament gaming is going to go like this? <laughs> It seems like there's um, different angles that it's taking now. It seems like Nintendo feels that there is a future in esports, which is why they, they're having the Nintendo World Championships uh, themed events again. Um, there's also a lot of games that have their own, um, I guess, uh, esports uh, tournaments, like League of Legends is huge, and like the FPS games are huge, and um, Overwatch is gonna be huge. There's, there's a lot of stuff out there that games themselves, each game can have sort of like their own competitive thing. We have Tetris uh, here at the Portland Retro Gaming Expo for, for the classic game stuff. Uh, it would really be nice to see more of the platform holders do it because then, you know, Sony or, or Microsoft or Nintendo you know, can have like a big tour or at least, you know, now they have like, you know, the Best Buy 8 City thing. Um, but maybe if that pans out well and they can expand it and they see more money in it, if they see money on the side that people actually come to events uh, since g gaming conventions themselves are, you know, like, you look around here and, you know, there's tons and tons of people that come to these things. If Nintendo ran their own event, like, sort of like, uh, like a PAX or, uh, like, um, Sony has one called, um, the PlayStation Experience. And it's, it's something like this, except it's actually Sony holding it. And they have, you know, they show games that aren't out yet and they make announcements there and they have, like, a stage. Uh, and then they run, uh, the, uh, the Capcom Cup finals are held at the PlayStation Experience. Uh, so that's an example of like a platform holder like putting up uh, an event that uh, people come to and, and it's bigger than what would you know just normally be like a small event. So uh, there's different ways that it can happen and then there's grassroots stuff like I said our, our Tetris tournament is, we're all run by fans but we have the, now we have sponsorship and backing at least the, the support of the people who own the Tetris uh, uh, IP so uh, that's good and uh, uh, lots of different ways to do it. Would you remind them what the Tetris tournament is? Um, it's a classic Tetris World Championships and the here, finals tomorrow. Right over there, right? Right, in our, in our Tetris arena. Um, and uh, it moved here um, in 2012 and it's been here ever since. And we're in our eighth year and there's a, yeah, we're in our eighth year. So um, we're, we're really happy to be here. Definitely check it out. I mean, today people are uh, trying their hardest to qualify. So you can just check out the action on the big screen. I'd say it's the closest thing to the NWC right now. I don't you think your NWC is closer? Or? No, I think the new one plays out like a reality show. And um, <laughs> one thing that modern esports is lacking is that Babe Ruth figure. Like poker got popular about 15 years ago because Chris Moneymaker won, and it was like a great story that regular people could relate to. And there isn't that individual in esports yet that people can relate to yet. Babe, baseball was around for 50 years, and Babe Ruth came around, and then they built a Hall of Fame. So this is when that when that one person comes and is larger than life and people can relate to them and make it bigger than what it is than just video games. Like then, then it's, that'll go to the next level, but you just can't make those types of people. Like even Chris Tang with all the energy he has, you're not gonna, you know, just it's hard, it's hard to make that person and you can't fake it. You just be able to be that person. Yeah, it's hard to have a single unifying game too because there's so many right. video games. There's, but luckily there's things like, you know, Street Fighter or Tetris or Overwatch, or, you know, big names with big, Games could have a champion that, that could be on that level. I mean, 
Uh, there is actually a video game Hall of Fame, and uh, Thor actually was inducted last year, and I got inducted. I'm getting inducted next month, so that's in that's in uh, Otumwa, Iowa. Um, sort of like their um, they call it the video game capital of the world. They're going to build a museum there, and they're going to have like those stars like they do in Hollywood with their names on it. So I'm going to so Thor and myself are going to have stars on that sidewalk thing, which is which is pretty cool. You know, I think would be really awesome is if uh, like a few cities, like say Chicago, New York. LA, uh, Dallas, I don't know, had like um, some like arenas built, like, you know, the NFL, they have their own stadiums, basically, they have their own stadiums, but a place that's got, uh, you know, that holds events, like, regularly, like, all the time, it's a full-time thing, where you can go. Yeah, like an eSports arena, it's used for various things. Yeah. I know someone who wants to do that, so hopefully, you know, things pan out, maybe we'll, we'll start to see a, yeah, things like that. The steadiness of, uh, of doing something on a regular basis it's, uh, that people can get into helps build things like Yeah, I mean, Tetris. we actually saw that with the Tetris. So we're, we're expanding and you know, we've got people flying in and, you know, Corian from Japan coming in is one of our uh, like favorite competitors. So we're, we're happy to see him here, uh, Yanni from Europe. Um, uh, it's, it's getting big and uh, we're, getting, we're getting bigger, so. Uh, I've, I've started a cousin, Dr. Mario Tournament at the Pittsburgh Replay FX Festival. So, I, yeah. you know, I want Vince is helping me with that. And just, just go out and play. I mean, that, that's the biggest thing. It's, it not, don't, it's sitting on the helmet and stream is great, but it's not standing up in front of people against good competition live. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't Usain Bolt and Michael Phelps don't get to set world records at their home swimming pool or a racetrack. They have to go compete. And I think that that's the main difference between eSports, which is people competing against one another and people just streaming what they can do at home because as good as the Tetris players are, we've yet to see a max out on stage. So it, there's, a, there's a level of doing it live versus doing it in front of people on a stream. So that, that it's good to get practice competing against other people and standing up and being uncomfortable and that sort of thing. Yeah, the energy of the live experience is, is the best. You can't re repeat that with Twitch or online. I think Corian did max out on stage earlier today. Yeah, it was today. <laughs> watch out, Jonas. Yeah, watch out, Jonas. <laughs> uh, what time is it? Okay. Uh, over, all right. Yeah, thanks for coming. I think we're going to have like an autograph session somewhere, so um, come hang out with us.